so this is our last day together, and uh, it's the day in which we, I think, finally truly all come together and um, share our experiences in, through our scenarios and so on. And uh, we'll hear from our, our wonderful elders who are going to share their experiences with us. Um, but to begin this morning as well, uh, John, my good friend, Leals, is going to talk about and, uh, and his uh, friend from Oregon, uh, Chris, is going, are going to talk about uh, the button blanket you've seen in here all week. So, did we, is everybody smudged? Who, who wishes to be smudged? Then I guess we will, we will proceed. In the back of the room on that side are sacred objects that have been brought in. And uh, Verna brought, as you know, as she discussed yesterday, the canoe and the snowshoes. I brought a button blanket from Skidigat, which is a brand new gift to me for my birthday. I hit the big seven zero on, uh, what was it, Saturday? I forgot already. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, the artist who made that button blanket, it's an eagle blanket because I'm eagle clan, Haida, took five years to do it. She was my teaching assistant when I taught grade 9, 10, and 11 in 1990, and has been a dear friend ever since and quite the artist. But you know, I was thinking about things Haida, we're eagle clan. And every morning when I worked on Haida Gwaii, I worked with the, as the First Nations Education Coordinator for the islands. I would stop by my elder's house, Pearl Pearson, for whom that drum back there is made with the hummingbird, her favorite crest. And I would just sit at her kitchen table and she would talk. And in those journeys, I would go around the world. I'd learn what was sacred and what wasn't, what was dear to our hearts of our, of our people and what wasn't. I learned the good I learned some of the things that were not good. I learned how my heart needed to be to live a good life. And this is the power of our elders as they pass along what they pass along. present from Chris Kibbe from Oregon, who was my teaching assistant in the high school, where we conspired to teach English to students who couldn't teach English, couldn't understand English, and to teach Spanish to students who didn't realize they'd be learning Spanish to <laughs> students in the same classroom. I would do the, I do Shakespeare in English, she would translate the Shakespeare lessons into Spanish. Students who could not write a Spanish essay because they were on the English side of the classroom get extra points if they could find somebody on the Spanish side to translate their essay for them. Students on the Spanish side of the classroom would get extra points if they go over the other side and find somebody to translate it into English for them. It worked very well. The beginning of the term started out with the class separated. Latino on one side and uh, Anglo on the other. By the end of each term, they were blended. They came together. because. They helped each other. So Chris is a quilter and now a maker of regalia for a Haida, namely this one, my 70th birthday. It's an Eagle Clan blanket. It's 
So um, as John mentioned, he's Eagle Plan. And this, this project started in the early 90s. And it came about because John was teaching this book, I Heard the Owl Call My Name. Mm -hmm. And it's um, a write-up of a priest that goes to live in a Quakutal village. And this is kind of the story of those interactions. And he brought in a button blanket. At the same time that John was teaching at high school, he was teaching at one of our local universities and working on his doctorate. And he brought in this beautiful button blanket. And uh, John's Lakota name is Medicine Horse. And his students at the university made him a button blanket with a horse mm -hmm. in the middle of it as his crest. Well, on Haida Gwaii, they don't have any horses. <laughs> horses are not a traditional Haida crest. But it was a beautiful blanket. It, it was gorgeous. But, but the part that was really sad for me was that these students who loved him dearly, I mean, clearly they did, or they would not have taken the time to do this, made him this beautiful blanket that he could never use. And he brought it in, and he showed it to the students. And I'm thinking to myself, this man has done so much, not only for these students here at the high school, but for his own community. Um, his, how he studied anthropology and archaeology. He would go up in the summers to Haida Gwaii and um, do archaeological work. We were in Newport, Oregon, on the coast below Portland. And he developed um, a recording system. They, there were elders in the village that were teaching the Haida language to students, but. From his perspective, it was a little frustrating because they saw they taught the same vocabulary over and over again, and they were just teaching the words without teaching the cultural components of the words. And he developed a recording system to record the elders so that they would be able to document the language and then expand the Haida Heritage Language Project, which he and a partner um, helped develop the curriculum. They developed the curriculum for this language project. And I'm, I'm like, he has done so much for the community. He deserves to have a blanket of his own that he can wear, and hopefully wear with pride, um, but that he can wear in his traditional environment when he goes back for potlatches. And Which is a big feast. <laughs> thus the project was born. OK, so I'm a native Oregonian that has lived all over the US. I knew absolutely nothing about the culture, nothing about making button blankets. John shows me this picture in this book. It's a book by Hillary Stewart about Northwest Coast art. And he goes, I really like this eagle. And it was an eagle drawn by a friend of his named Bill Reed. Beautiful eagle. And he goes, this eagle has all the elements of traditional Haida art. I'm like, cool. So unbeknownst to John, a couple of years later, I, I bought my own copy of the book, took it in, and had this copying company make this giant poster of this eagle so that I could use it as a pattern to make John a button blanket. Fast forward 20 years, and OK, it's time to make John's button blanket. He's not getting any younger than me. If I'm going to do this, I need to do it while I can still move a needle, right? And so um, I acquired a lot of books, and read a lot about Haida culture. John kept saying, I want a traditional blanket. Well, traditional blankets were made out of cedar bark. And I'm like, OK, where am I going to find some pounded cedar bark? <laughs> and then I'm reading. And during contact times, the Hudson's Bay Company brought in uh, Hudson's Bay blankets. And so the Haida people started using, they would wrap themselves in the, Haida, in the uh, wool blankets. I'm like, wool, I can find wool. So um, one of the forms of wool that they referred to was melton cloth. And Benny was talking about melton cloth because the beautiful vest that she was wearing that had all the embroideries made out of melton cloth. OK, and John says, OK, well, blue and black are traditional with red. So I think I want a blue one. All right, so I go to the fabric <laughs> store and I buy blue melton cloth. And red melting cloth. And then he's like, well, they don't really use wool anymore. I'm like, great. I can use this to make a suit or something. You know, it, it's an okay And uh, so then he, he's telling me, yeah, they use this super suede. And I told him I was going to talk about him. To, so just, just ignore the looks on his face because he never <laughs> So I'm, I'm like searching online. Because I go into my local fabric store and they're like, super sweet. 
we've got suede, but it's not called super suede. And I'm like, well, you know, this is supposed to be traditional. I need to use the right kind of fabric. No super suede anywhere. Not online, not in any of the fabric stores, and I'm calling all over the country, you know. Have you ever heard of super suede? No. no. And I'm like, John, could you please? And part of, part of the, <laughs> as the, the person who's trying to learn about this, right, is that I don't know anybody on Hyde Y. I only know John. But I know that he has people in his family that have done this. One of them is quite well known. And I'm like, couldn't you ask Stephanie? And he goes, no. I can't ask Stephanie, because if I ask Stephanie, she's going to feel really bad that I didn't ask her to make the blanket for me. And I'm like, well, couldn't you tell Stephanie that you didn't ask me either? I volunteered. You know? And no, we can't do that. He goes, Let me talk to my cousin Pearl. You know, Well, Pearl is 91 now. And, and I don't really know if Pearl's ever made a button blanket. I'm going to assume that she has, but I don't know that for sure. But anyway, you know, he always tells people that it took me five years to do this project, but he never explains why. <laughs> so eventually, he comes back with, well, maybe the name of the stuff is Ultra Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and so then and he goes, well, it's really, really expensive, but he doesn't say how expensive. And uh, so I call around, and, and yeah, I get this fabric store in Portland, and yeah, we sell Ultra Suede, but it's 90 bucks a yard. And I knew I needed like six yards of it, right? So I'm like, okay, that's not a problem. Um, I need black, and I need red. And they're like, well, which red? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I need kind of a, like a cherry red. Oh, we've got that. And, and I'm like, well, could you send me a swatch of it or a swatch of a couple different colors of red? Because look around. I mean, there's people wearing red. There's red. There's red. You know, there's some red in that skirt. Oh, there's red over there. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of red. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, we can send you a swatch. And uh, the swatch never came. <laughs> so that was another part of the problem. And so then, eventually, I get the fabric. Okay, I'm ready to move forward. So I pull out this copy of this Bill Reed Eagle. This eagle has gone from Salt Lake, back to Newport, then to Salem, down to Eugene. And I'm like, OK, I've got this pattern. I'm ready to go. And John's like, you can't use that. I'm like, why? <laughs> and it's private property. It belongs to Bill Reed's family. Bill Reed has since passed away, but it's his drawing. And his family, his wife and his foundation, hold the right to that design. And if we want to use that design, we have to pay for the right to use it. So then he tells me, you need to draw your own design. And I'm like, oh, I don't know anything about it. I, I can look in the books and, oh, that looks really beautiful. And, uh, and I'm like, well, could you help? And he goes, well, I'm not an artist. <laughs> in all of the books that I read about this, it talks about the artist, whether they're male or female, drawing out the design, and then the blanket maker taking that design and, and creating the blanket from that. So I'm like, OK, this looks like a one-woman show. <laughs> but I didn't grow up in the culture. And so I had to learn. Excuse me as I move around. <laughs> so the, these are all traditional forms. And each of the forms has its own name. So, so this is a U shape. By having this in the middle of it, it turns it into a split U. Both of those are traditional shapes. This little thingy down here is called a flicker tip. So it turns the U shape into a particular type of feather, right? Um, this is a regular U shape. This thing here is called an ovoid. And so for me, when, when I had been creating drawings in the past, um, I had an image in my mind, I would draw the outline of it, and then I would fill in the space. So I'm, I'm like looking at hundreds of pictures of eagles in flight, eagles landing. OK, I can do this. And I draw one that kind of looks like the, the um, Imperial Russian. <laughs> I draw another one that kind of looks like the German thing. And I'm like, no, this isn't working. And, and when I draw, I tend to draw things that look very natural in nature. 
And so that's why my research was from um, all of these photographs of beautiful bald eagles, right? And, but it wasn't working, and I, I would email these drawings to John, and he would say, it's flat. And I'm like, well, duh, it's a drawing on a flat piece of paper. Of course it's going to be flat. And he's like, well, it doesn't work for me. And I'm, I'm like, I need feedback. I need critical, constructive feedback so that I can change what I'm doing. He goes, I don't like it. And I'm like, what do you like? And he's like, well, um, the, the shapes are wrong. And I'm like, OK, which shape? And it doesn't have any tension. And I'm thinking to myself, tension? What's tension? And I'm like, John, what's tension? And all he could say was, like, it's like a ball that is kind of squished. And I'm like, OK. I've got a ball. It's kind of squished, right? You know? It's not working. So then I learn about these. Actually, I found these, these two books. Um, one is Learning by Doing, and one is, like, learning by designing or, or something similar to that. Um, they come from the Kwak Wakawa perspective, so not the Haida perspective, but at least one of them showed the different art forms, and so they showed North Coast, Mid Coast, South Coast, Haida's North Coast. So I could look at the different styles, and they would they would talk about which style it was. Was it Shimshian? Was it Klingit? Was it... Um, Quack, quack, quack. Was it like Bella Bella or Bella Kula or whatever? Was it Haida? So I focused in on the Haida ones and learned to draw these shapes. And once I made the transition in my head and figured out what they do is they take these shapes and fill in the space with the shapes to create the design. And once I had that kind of straight in my brain, then I was able to draw something that looked more correct. And so going back and forth with this wonderful communication that I have with this English language arts teacher, a former reporter, um, I would be on the phone with them. And oftentimes, we'll use FaceTime or Skype. And I'd go, Darlene, help. And so Darlene would have to join in the conversation and kind of interpret what we were each saying. <laughs> it's like we were speaking foreign languages, right? But eventually, we came up with this design that I could live with and that he could live with. And, and mind you, I've never done this before, but this has been quite the research project, quite you know, um, the learning experience for me. And so then once we had a design, then um, he had to send it to the matriarch of his family, Pearl, his cousin Pearl. And so um, everything has to be approved. So that was another period of time. I'm like, have you talked to Pearl about the design? Well, first of all, Pearl isn't online. So he either had to send the drawing by snail mail or by email to one of his cousins who would then, at some point, take it to Pearl's house. So sometime later, we get approval for the design. So even though I'm the artist of this design, this design now belongs to John's family, and no one else can use it, including me. Yeah, and uh, so, <laughs> so that part was good. And John, the whole time, has said this needs to be a traditional blanket. Well, traditional blankets are all done by hand. So all of this is hand-stitched, oh, all of it. And, uh, and you have um, buttons. And I'm like, so do the buttons go on the black? Do the buttons go on the red? I'm looking all over the internet. There is nothing online that tells me how to create a button blanket. There's no step-by-step -step instructions out there anywhere. Well, in while I was teaching, I came across this book called The Button Blanket. And it's about this little girl who is having a button blanket made for her by a family member, and she's going to wear it at, she's going to dance at the potlatch. And the tradition is that these blankets, um, they're also called robes, are danced into life, danced into being at a potlatch. So John is now honor bound 
to dance at his next potlatch to give life to his robe. Um, otherwise, it won't be a robe of power. Um, I have seen you dance. You danced with a Celeste elder in your classroom. I know you can do it if you stop being mad about it. <laughs> Get the mind out of it. So, so anyway, in that book, it says, you measure from the nape of the neck down to, like, about the ankles. So he's in Ottawa, and I'm in Oregon. There's Darlene. <laughs> Measuring John, and it says from tinger, fingertip to fingertip, which this is pretty good from fingertip to fingertip. So that's how you get your measurements. In in Haida art, like I said, they started out with cedar bark that they did, didn't decorate hardly at all. They might have painted a little bit very, very early on. As the art form evolved, it came into being that they fill up the space. This is a blank canvas, a space to be filled. And so this design goes from edge to edge, and pretty much from top to bottom, not quite. Um, and so, you know, I took an overhead projector and blew it up on my kitchen wall and traced it out on paper to get the pattern of it. So then I have to wait for him to have these conversations with his cousin Pearl about where the buttons go. And I'm like wanting to move forward. So I get the eagle cut out and I start doing all my stitching. So the eagle is an applique that is stitched on first. And then I get information about the buttons. Well, you know, the eagle part is already done. And come to find out, the buttons are supposed to be placed on the red. So in some places, there's not very much red. So I took a little artistic license and did them like right on the edge. So, so yes, they're on the red, but they're a little bit on the black as well. Um, it might not be perfect, but for me, it's a token of my esteem for John out of respect for the, who he is as a person and the work that he has done as now an elder in his community. But having done this work over a period of a few decades, you know, from the time that he found out that he was Haida and went to learn about his family. And uh, even though there may be some glitches on it, like um, he wanted to honor his cousin Pearl and we did a hummingbird design in both of these ovals. And we thought we had permission from Pearl to use the hummingbird, but I don't know, a year, year and a half, maybe two years later, Pearl's like, oh, the hummingbird's not one of our crests. We can't use it. So, so we had to take the hummingbird off. Um, now this potlatch is a family gathering to talk about the family crest. I'm hoping and praying that the hummingbird actually is one of their crests. And although I really like these buttons, because to me they represent the Trinity, um, I'm hoping that at some point I'll be able to take these buttons off and replace them with the hummingbirds again. So there you have it. <laughs> so just five years. regular buttons. Yeah. Yeah. Please talk about the They're, buttons. Those yeah. are abalone buttons yeah. from abalone shells? Yeah. They are all shell buttons that I collected over a number of years to make sure I had enough. And there are 1,400 of them. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Some blankets have thousands of them. It just depends on the detail. They used to um, do very simple designs and uh, they, they would use the shell buttons or they would use dentalia. Uh, if you go to the museum, you'll see buttons that have a mix. So there are some blankets that have just Intelia. There are some that have just buttons. There are some that are a mix. That was a whole nother conversation. Um, but, um, you know, it, it was, as a novice, this was the best I could do with this, my first endeavor. So I hope that he wears it with pride. Wow. Um, there, there's a company called Shells. I have a Joanne's fabric store right next to my house. Yeah. And uh, so there's a company called Shells, and they do a bag of half inch, half inch buttons. And I don't know how many centimeters that translates to, like two and a half maybe centimeters. And then they do um, another bag that has mixed sizes. But 
you'll see some itty bitty buttons down here. Those were the hardest ones for me to find. And I found them at another store called Hancock Fabrics, and they had to special order them for me. Joanne's also special ordered buttons for me. These big ginormous buttons all came from a um, supply shop called Wandering Bull that's in um, the New England or New York area. And uh, so they had a lot of different sizes, and so I ordered a few buttons from them. And uh, just so buttons from different places. And I'm sure that the people in the Pacific Northwest that make these on a regular basis, no supply shops, but I don't know any of those people. And you know, you don't feel comfortable calling up a Stephanie Price or a Dorothy Grant and saying, hey, where do you get your supplies from? You know, um, it's not the right thing to do, as you all know. So I just did the best I could in, in uh, getting the sizes that would work for what we wanted. And uh, this is all done with um, a string, a heavyweight Coates and Clark string that's an outdoor weight, you know, so because I want it to last for a while. And then what I did was, um, you're supposed to sew the buttons on with a running stitch. I don't know if you've ever seen any bead work where the knot comes undone and the beads go flying or the same thing, strand of pearls. So yes, I sort of used a running stitch, but what I did was I knotted after each button. So if part of it does come loose, he won't lose all the buttons. Any other technical questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Are you going to write a book about your adventure real quick? You know, it's been suggested. I'm in the middle of doing um, PhD. Not in button blankets? I think you need a PhD in button blankets. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been suggested that I write a, a paper or a book about it, and yeah. that I switch my PhD from Latino student engagement to the process of making a button blanket by a complete novice. Yeah. And it so. wouldn't take five years. No. <laughs> I'm at a, at completely and totally at a loss for words. In all my life, I have been honored in certain ways, but to be honored like this was beyond my, my, my dreams, both between Chris and my wife and the work that went into it. Family approval of the crest. It's an evil crest. You can tell it's evil because the, the oh, I forgot to say, that among the Haida, we're all either Eagle Clan or Raven Clan. And under those two clans are the other clans, hummingbirds, the, the wolf, the killer whale, all grouped under the two main crests. So our, our family is Eagle, the uh, Nasalanis clan, the Sandy Beach people. Are, it's an eagle plan, and so it needed to be an eagle design. So Pearl said that the... What he's leaving out here is when he yeah. went to Pearl for a design, she gave him grizzly bear. She and did. he didn't want to use grizzly bear. <laughs> That's why he has an eagle, because anybody in the eagle clan can use eagle. Now you can go on. So <laughs> Pearl approved it. Her use of the, Chris's use of the shapes are, are culturally flawless. The tension in the design, it's like the eagle is almost fly, is amazing. The, in, we have the, in the eagle crest, the beak hooks. And that's the main difference, because with the raven crest, the beak is more straight. But other than that, they're the same. So this is classic eagle design, approved by my family. Most certainly approved by my wife and I for what is more than 26 years of friendship and loyalty and friendship. And where do you find that these days? So thank you all very much for sharing in this celebration of 70 years of age and the fact that people sometimes really do love you. <laughs> the world is good and it's the right place to be. Thank you. Thank you.